What we really need now is a passage before we come around the communion table that might help us to understand the importance of stepping into new experiences in our life. Joshua chapter 3 is exactly where we are. It's perfect. It's sovereign that God would bring that passage to this day at this time in history. So buckle in. Getting ready for the cross. Turn in your Bibles or your uh, smartphone or your iPad or whatever you have to Joshua chapter 3. Let's let God's word speak to us today. During a picnic in a park, a man noticed a rather strange sight. Two men from the city parks department were working very feverishly in the summer heat. One of them was digging a hole. The other came right behind him and filled the dirt back in. He watched this for the whole lunch hour and thinking, this is my tax dollars at work. I have got to find out what's going on. So he goes up and talks to him, and one of the guys stops digging the hole and says, well, I'll tell you what's going on. We're a three-man crew in charge of planting trees. And the guy in charge of putting the tree in the middle is sick. So we're carrying on without him today. I'm going somewhere with this. All of us in this room are creatures of habit. If we don't find ways to remind ourselves why we do what we do, we will start just going through the motions. And that is true no more in as important a place as the church of Jesus Christ. Of all the many activities that we do here, we must always remember why we do what we do. Our purpose is to bring glory to God. In fact, this church has a purpose statement that outlines the trees that should be put in the hole of God's purpose. The first one is that we need to increasingly be committed to God. We grow in that. Secondly, Jesus Christ said, by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for each other. So we're, we're wanting to be connected with each other within the body of Christ increasingly. And thirdly, we need to obey the, the command to continue to serve him. See, God is in the business of getting things done. God is not just in the business of doing things. This passage in the study Bible I'm going to read to you is actually given a title in my Bible called Israel crosses the Jordan River. But there's so much more going on in this chapter than just God herding his people from point A to point B. It's why he's doing it. It's what he's affirming as he do does it. That is what gives us our truth today. So here's the big idea. God doesn't waste any situation in order to prepare me to better serve his eternal purposes. Even when those situations are unwanted or unexpected. I must never forget that those are exactly the kinds of places into which God is planting his purpose in my life with intention, if I'm willing to obediently nurture those purposes. So here's the background to this passage, and I'll read to you most of the passage today, Joshua chapter 3. Chapters 3 and 4 of Joshua is really a double telling of the same story. It is the story of God's people being going from this side of the Jordan River, crossing the Jordan into what is going to be called the promised land. And it's so important how they cross and why they cross that it's told twice. We're going to look at just chapter 3 today as it tells us what the intention is behind it, how to prepare themselves for it. And then chapter 4 next week we'll look at is the actual crossing. It'll end today in chapter 3 with telling us how God's people went across, but Next week, we'll unpack even more. In fact, I'm going to entitle next week's message, Don't Forget to Tell the Kids What God is Teaching You. So let me backtrack with you to the last time I preached a sermon in the book of Joshua was a month ago. It was Joshua chapter 2. You may remember it was a story of spy and intrigue as two of the Israelite men were sent over the Jordan River into the town of Jericho to spy it out to see what they were going to have to deal with when they crossed over. And you may remember the story, how they, they came back with the thrilling account, and, and, their, and their final words were almost word for word what Rahab, the harlot turned believer, had said to them. Here's what their report was. Truly the Lord has given all the land over there into our hands, and moreover, all the inhabitants that live over there are faint-hearted because of us. Essentially, that's a restatement of God's purpose for why 40 years earlier, he delivered God's people from slavery in Egypt. 
It was because he was preparing for himself a nation that would bring glory to him and eventually bring salvation to us through Jesus Christ. We'll celebrate that when we conclude the sermon today. God doesn't deliver us just to put us in a, in a format of doing things in the same pattern. God delivers us so that we are soldiers to move forward, to take captive any situation in our lives, even the ones we don't like, so it can bring glory to God. I don't always like to hear that, but it's pretty true. God has supernaturally transformed my life through Jesus Christ and yours, if you're a believer, so that our current life will accomplish his purposes, so we can point at God, even when we're going through difficult times. Now, there were some great old hymns written about the crossing of the Jordan. We don't, we don't sing them much anymore, like, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful eye to Canaan's fair and promised land where my possessions lie. And we, and we always refer to, or many times refer to crossing the Jordan as dying and going to heaven. That's not really the right theology. The right theology is we're not crossing to go into heaven. We're crossing into new opportunities to bring glory to God while we're still on this earth. The true theme of the book of Joshua is also the theme of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, where the writer says, let's go on to maturity, not to perfection. Doubt and unbelief always tempts me to say, you know, let's go back to where it's safe. But faith says, let's move forward to where God is leading. Remember, it was this groupthink of unbelief 40 years earlier when Israel was about ready to go into the promised land that delayed them for four decades from going into the promised land. It was their doubt, their disbelief. We can't do it. That's why it's important not to miss the significance of how the Israelites are getting ready to cross the Jordan River. So I've, I've broken this down into a, predictably three points. And they're familiar to you. Get ready to cross the Jordan. Get set to cross the Jordan and get going to cross the Jordan. I think you can see where I'm going with that. And then we'll end with get ready for the cross as we come around communion. The children of Israel are about 10 miles back from the Jordan River. They've heard the reports of the spies that the people in Jericho are fearful and Joshua orders the people now to break camp, travel those 10 miles and come right up to the Jordan River. But then, before they cross the Jordan River, three things are going to be required of them. These are important. In fact, I think I have them. You can write them down. Number one, they were, first of all, to wait on the Lord. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. They set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, and he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. It's almost like Joshua was saying, hurry, get up. We're going. We're leaving. This is it. And then they walk up to there, and then they wait for three days. Why would God do that? Why not just let them go over? Well, sometimes pausing helps us see things more clearly. Remember, there's a couple million Israelites ready to walk across the Jordan River. And the Jordan River, we're told in verse 15, if you put your finger down there, the Jordan River is at flood stage. That means we can't get across it easily. Now remember, here they are standing by the banks of a flood. Have you ever stood by the banks of a flooded river? you ever watch on TV floods as they go by? If you've ever stood there, you know there's a smell to the muddy, the muddy water. You know that it looks tempestuous. It, it, looks, it looks foreboding. I think the reason God had them stay there for three days in front of a flooded river is so that the people could say, what is Joshua thinking? This can't be good for my kids. How am I going to get them across this river? And look at grandpa and grandma. They're in walkers. How are they going to get across the Jordan River at flood stage? Three days is just about enough time to pause and realize, unless God helps us, we're sunk. I wonder if that's why God puts us in situations where we sometimes have to pause. So that we reach a point where we say, God, I guess it's come to this. I have to depend on you. It builds our joy in the faith of God when we trust his sovereign plan, even in the pauses of our lives. Some of them might seem long, but it's an important step in my growth for me to learn to live in the pause. The second thing they were required to do is they were to follow unconditionally. 
At the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp, verse 2, and commanded the people. Here's what I command you. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord your God, being carried by the Levitical priest, you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet, maintain or keep the distance between you about a thousand yards, 200 cubits. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you should go, for you have not passed this way before. Very specific instructions about how far. Don't get too close. Don't stay too far away. If you're too close, all you can see is the flood. If you're too far away, you don't know where we're leading. Stay close to the ark. See where God's symbol of his presence is taking you. No matter how turbulent and impossible the flood seems, the ark should be your focus. Reminds me a little of Peter having to keep his eyes on Jesus when he wanted to walk in the water and Jesus said, come out. And then Peter started looking at the waves and started sinking. Perhaps you need to be reminded about Jesus Christ, our Joshua, our Yeshua, our ark of safety. Perhaps you need to be reminded that no matter where you are, he's already been there. He knows through his sovereign grace what you're walking into. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We must keep our eyes on that ark of safety. His death, willing death for us, changes everything. Hebrews 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. I'm not one of those guys who likes to uh, walk by faith. Maybe you are. I'd, I'd like to know the details. Many times on our road trip, I would ask my faithful navigator, Siri, hey, Siri, how far to Idaho Falls? How far to Bozeman, Montana? It's no surprise I'm one of those who'd like God to do that for me, but God is not Siri. God is in the process of not just giving me information. God is in the process of building character into my life. It doesn't matter so much where you go as who you follow. I should say, I should have had you write that down. That's good stuff. It doesn't matter so much where you go as who you follow. Thirdly, they were to consecrate themselves thoroughly. Take a look at verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. It's true of me, and I'm sure it's true of all of us, that we cannot clearly hear God speak to us when sin is lodged in our hearts somewhere. If there's a pattern of sin, you will not hear God clearly. It just works that way. The word consecrate in this verse, kadash, is literally almost the same word as the New Testament word for sanctify, to set apart for a special purpose. In other words, they were not to treat this coming crossing of the Jordan as just some casual, clever new activity. They were to confess their sin, block out pettiness, care for each other. In a word, they were supposed to heighten this physical experience with spiritual focus. We are now two months into our new name, Grace Point. If we, as a church family, are going to see that name serve its purpose, which is to identify us with God's grace and truth and to treat others with grace and each other with grace, then we're going to have to constantly make daily personal consecrations. Consecration is not some stuffy Old Testament concept or or some concept from the past that we don't need to worry about. Each and every day, each of us should get up and re-consecrate ourselves for what we're going to cross over into that day. Am I making myself ready? 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify or consecrate you through and through. May your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of Jesus Christ. To do that, I need to consecrate myself daily to the causes of him. Okay, that was getting ready for the cross. How about get set for the cross? This is the biggest part of the passage, verses 7 through 13. I think one of the hardest things for us to do before a big event is to listen to instructions. That's why when we get on an airplane and they say, would you please pay attention to the flight attendants as they tell you these things, we kind of go, oh, really, again, I've heard this again and again and again. It's why students do so poorly on tests when they don't read instructions. It's why they do so poorly on homework when they don't read their instructions. 
God is setting the stage for Israel to cross with some, hey, listen up, instructions in verses 7 to 13. He begins with a personal, quiet, private affirmation of Joshua. And he says this to Joshua. He just says it to Joshua. Today I will begin to exalt you, Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I was with Moses... I will be with you. For the past 40 years, Israel's been sitting around telling stories about this great guy named Moses. Can you imagine being Joshua? Nobody wants to follow that. And now God is essentially saying, now Joshua, it's your turn. Yes, I showed myself to the people in a powerful way through Moses when we crossed the Red Sea. And Moses became a hero, but now we're crossing over into the promised land, and they need another hero. And Joshua, you are going to be that leader. Just like I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Now, what's amazing about that is is it's such a wonderful reminder of how it is that although the, the past can sometimes be very helpful for motivating us, it runs out of fuel quickly. What we need is future vision. Vance Havner said this, beware of going back to what you once were when God is leading you to become something that you've not yet been. The best motivation for present ministry is a future vision of what God is doing. That's one of the reasons why, maybe you should pull out your little little calendars now and, and let you know that the third week in September, I have this right, don't I, Steve? The 16th of September, we're gonna be doing a, uh, a celebration. You think it's the 9th? Either the 9th or the 16th, we're going to be doing a 70th anniversary celebration so we can remember what God did and motivate ourselves to move forward. I'll clear that up for you in a bit. And then in verses 8 to 11, God continue, Joshua continues to set the stage and he puts a new spotlight on God. In other words, give glory to God. And he says this to the people. As for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant that when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still on the Jordan. And so Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here, listen to the words of the Lord. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, come here, listen, God says I'm the guy. God says I'm the most important guy now, forget about Moses, it's all about me. He actually doesn't tell anyone what God said to him personally. Instead, he goes on to say, let me tell you some things about this God who's going to take you across. He says, first of all, listen to the words of the Lord, your God. And then Joshua said, here's how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you the following people, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into Jordan. Why is he so specific? Why does Joshua get so specific about the seven groups of people that they will conquer? Couldn't he just have said, the bad guys? Now he lists them specifically because I believe that God wants us to have spiritual detail in our lives. We find it easy sometimes to believe the spiritual generalities, but difficult to believe the spiritual specifics. For example, we find it easy to believe that God loves the world. We struggle with the fact that God could love that obnoxious person we can't get along with at work or at church or in our neighborhood. We find it easy to believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but we find it more difficult to believe that God cares about my checking account at Farmers and Merchants Bank. We know God forgives sin, but Will he still forgive that secret struggle we may be having with gossip or dishonesty or lust or greed? Joshua lists these details for the people so that they remember God is a God of the specifics. We're invited to trust a God who specifically loves us in very personal ways. John 10, 3, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 1 Peter 5, cast your anxieties. It doesn't list which ones, just any of your anxieties on him. He cares for you. And then Joshua will command that one man be selected from each of the 12 tribes to pick up a rock. And we'll discover in the next chapter a little bit more about what that's all about. And then he informs the people exactly what's going to happen. 
Therefore, take 12 men from the tribe of Israel, one, tri one each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priest, bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth, shall rest on the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand up in a heap. Joshua is stepping way out in faith to deliver this message. Remember, he's talking to lots of people. He says, feel free to just walk into the river. Can you imagine what a disaster this would be if this doesn't happen? They would become the laughing stock of the entire promised land. Those people walked into the water and it swept them away. Imagine how much faith this takes. So with the stage set, there's nothing left to do but get going for the cross. In case you've lost track, this is the third point I'm on. Get going for the cross. The time of preparation and setup is over. It's time for action. So here's what happens. And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zareth, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over, opposite Jericho. It's a literal miracle in response to the faith of God's people to move forward. Remember, in Joshua 1.3, God had said, Joshua, every place where the sole of your foot touches, that's going to be your land. Who would have believed that the very first place their souls would touch would be water, not land? And God would make the water disappear so that even the, wa even the land in the water, in the riverbank, would be theirs unless I am willing to get my feet wet, trusting that the sovereign God of holiness is allowing even this, whatever the this is that's going on in my life, I'm not like, likely to make much progress during crossover times if I'm not willing to step out. What is it that God has asked you or me to do lately that we haven't done? Maybe it has to do with ministry or with family or witnessing to someone, or restoring a relationship that's been fractured. Getting my feet wet with action has to happen before God does the big job of heaping up the river. Verse 17, now the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing. The word nation there is the word go e, which literally means a flock or a herd moving as one. In fact, the root word of this word in Hebrew is the word for body. Does that ring a bell to you? What's the New Testament concept of a church? A body, something that moves together with purpose. It's the same concept that'll be used in the New Testament when our Joshua, our Jesus, our Yeshua, our Savior calls us to an eternal purpose of unity with each other. The Israelites were not free one at a time to lollygag across the river whenever they wanted. They moved together as a body, as a nation. God still chooses to work through the unity of his people. We don't call them nations today, we call them churches. But the concept is the same. Church unity is not just a nice thing to have. Jesus calls us the key feature in accomplishing God's will for the church. Are you daily praying for this church? I, I know you expect me to. I'm the pastor, right? Is it in my job description? I don't remember. But you expect me to pray for the church. Shouldn't you each individually, every day, pray for this body of believers? See, the answer is yes. Are you praying for God to grant you a spirit of unity with others, openness, and joy with all the changes physically and emotionally that will happen to us, even the change of seeing the Brazenly family move from here to cross to a new field? Are we ready to pray for each other? Maybe you're here today and you're facing one of your own crossover points in life. Maybe it's something difficult that you're not sure how you're going to handle. Maybe it's something financial. Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe it's something in your family. Maybe it's something in your life or in your finances or in your health. 
The truth is, these are questions we need to ask ourselves that we've just walked through. When I asked myself, okay, as a result of this sermon, what question should Perry ask himself? It was this. Number one, am I ready to submit to God thoroughly? Not partially, thoroughly. The second question, is my heart set to waiting on him? Trusting that even the details about which I'm concerned are already in his hands. And thirdly, am I willing to go forward following him unconditionally, even when he puts before me something I may not be too excited about? Not long before his death, Henry Nouwen wrote a book called Sabbatical Journeys. He wrote about some friends of his who were literally trapeze artists called the Flying Rondellas. They told Nouwen there's a special relationship between the one who flies through the air and the one who has to catch him. The flyer is the one that lets go. The catcher is the one that grasps hold. And both have to do their part so that there's not a tragedy. As the flyer swings high above the crowd, the moment comes when he has to let go. He arcs into the air, and his job is to remain as still as possible and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to grab hold. And one of the rondellas told now and this, quote, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust for the catcher to catch him. To be real crossover people, we begin by facing the cross of our Joshua, our Yeshua, our Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just talk about and teach about the cross? Aren't you glad he willingly laid down his life for us? Just as the Ark of the Covenant stood firm in the middle of the Jordan River while the whole nation crossed over, so too Jesus Christ died for us and still stirs the heart of people, invites them to cross over from sin to salvation, to trust him alone for purpose and eternal salvation, the more I depend on God, the more dependable I find him to be. I'm going to ask the servers to come up, and we're going to share together our own moment of cross, a reminder of why we do what we do. Let me repeat what I said when I first began the sermon. All of us are creatures of habit. If we don't find a way to remind ourselves why we do what we do, we're likely to begin just going through the motions. And that's why Jesus Christ instituted something like this. You know what helps? Food. Food helps. Our best friends met with us in a restaurant in Miles City, Montana a couple days ago before we came back. We sat at a great restaurant and we had great food and we laughed and we joked and we commented and then we got more serious and we talked about life and family and future and God. And you know what helped? Food. It helped us. It helped us focus. That's why so many of Israel's festivals included food. It's why Jesus used the Passover to institute a new reminder of a sacrifice in a meal we call the Last Supper. So we welcome you today to the Lord's table.